would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Friday edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please don't hold that against me. Welcome to the end of another week, folks. Today is the cutoff day for submitting your entry, I guess we could call it, into receiving that $50 Amazon gift card. The way to jump in and participate and get yourself on that list to potentially win that drawing is to head over to therebelbroker.com, click the big red button at the top of the page titled Take the Survey to Support the Show. Give the same email address, and it has to be a good email address because that's how you end up winning. Uh, it has to be a good email address both times you're asked. Answer the demographic style questions that follow. And then you're in. Uh, you're and you've done two things. You've helped the show grow. Thank you very much. And you've put your name in the hat to potentially win that fifty dollar Amazon gift card. And I am going to be drawing that name sometime around five p.m. Pacific time today, uh, Friday. So jump in and uh, get your name submitted so you can potentially win fifty bucks. Of course, if you do miss out on the drawing deadline for today, uh, for April. Not a huge worry. We've been doing this for a while now. I think we're up to 300 bucks worth of drawings. We've had quite a few folks win over the last few months. Uh, congratulations to them. Uh, thanks for, to the folks who do submit, uh, and good luck to you. And, of course, we'll do this again in May. Uh, we're not going to do this forever as time goes on, but at some point we will cut it off. So while you can, submit your name, get yourself in there. And good luck to you. I hope you win the $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, also, if you'd like to join the Rebel Underground, that is a group of listeners who have decided they'd like to get the inside scoop on stuff, get access to exclusive content, including videos that you will only be able to see or get access to if you're a member of the Rebel Underground. Now, to join the Rebel Underground, you can either go to the show notes for any of the shows. Well, at least any of the shows since last week, since I only started putting the link in show notes last week. Uh, but you can go to the show notes for today's show, for instance, and there will be a button to join the Rebel Underground. Or you can text the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222. That's the word Rebel Broker, all one word, to the number 44222. Uh, follow the prompts after that on your on your texting device and you will be all set to go. And your welcome email will give you a link to the very first piece of um, exclusive video content, which is a sort of a walkthrough of how I drill down from a much larger metro area into specific neighborhoods I want to consider for investment. Uh, there's another video that's going to be coming out uh, soon that takes you to the next step where you focus on a specific property. And this is all aimed at you being able to get as far as you possibly can without leaving your desktop to go to the area to physically visit. So this is going to be a great tool for folks who are potentially considering investing in areas outside of where they live or that are that are hours and hours and hours away. Uh, and for those of us in California, that might be a very real option. As we've discussed on previous shows, some of the best places to invest that are giving you the absolute best return on investment are nowhere near California. So uh, places like what? We've talked about Memphis. We've talked about um, some of my personal favorites like um, Chattanooga. And I'm still not 100% sure why I have Chattanooga on the brain, but I do. Uh, so the, the different areas that have that have given you great returns on investment based on if you bought a year ago, what what would you have made up to this point kind of kind of numbers, which we discussed earlier this week. Uh, and, and that that's an absolute draw. And it's a great way to examine those before you go and get the ground truth. I've had folks uh, reach out to me. I've had two types of people reach out to me on this advice. And, you know, it's up to you. It's 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 about what level of uh, risk you want to deal with. I've had some investors tell me that they have done what I do in terms of checking things out at a distance up to and including buying sight unseen without ever having gone to the property. And they have talked about the great success they've had doing that. Great. I am happy 
that that resulted in a great success for you. I personally would not do that. Whatever it's going to cost you to travel across the country to go visit that property, think of it as an insurance policy. Frankly, eyes on and getting some ground truth is far too valuable to me. So my suggestion is that you not do that. Um, Ultimately, before you actually sign those papers, I think you need to walk through the property. You need to drive the neighborhood. You need to talk to the people who have been your partners. Maybe you've been dealing with a real estate agent from a distance, someone who's been coordinating the transaction, standing there while inspectors have been doing their thing. I, I personally wouldn't make an offer sight unseen unless, and again, that's not a 100% rule. But if I had a property that met every requirement and I had a huge level of confidence in the person I had acting as my representative locally, uh, and I was able to to see all this data before I ever wrote up an offer, um, I would write up an offer. However, I would would include the requirement for inspections, right? So that I, even though, because let's, let me give you a scenario. So One area where it would really be possible, where I would absolutely do it, would be, let's say I found a home and I think it's a fantastic deal, and I don't think it's going to last much longer. I would, and and let's say I haven't even found anything out about this property. Uh, I would reach out to a local real estate person, uh, and I would put together an offer, but I would make it, one of the contingencies would be the general inspections contingencies, and then within the next, within that time frame, I would go and I would physically visit the property so that I still have an out uh, in case it's just way more disappointing in person than it looked on paper. Um, and that's something you can absolutely do. If, if you think to yourself, if you do what I'm suggesting you do in terms of how you analyze a local market, and you get to the point where you think, this looks like a great deal. You've, you've drilled down. You've, you've gone and you've looked at, say, some larger metro area. You've, you've gone through the steps I've suggested to narrow it down to certain areas. You found neighborhoods you really like. You went in there and looked in more detail and found homes for sale that look fantastic. And you have then taken the next steps and a- analyzed that specific property as much as you possibly can remotely, which would include... You've Googled things and figured out what the tax implications are, what the local regulations are relating to what you want to do with the property to the best of your ability, and you're convinced this is a great investment, and you're also convinced because of you've been maybe looking at this one, this area a little bit longer and know things don't last, you want to submit an offer. Don't let the fact you haven't been able to see it physically yet stop you. Just write that offer so that you have that window of opportunity to go and physically look at it to decide if it makes sense or not. Um I think that's a great way to go. I've done that with local stuff even where uh, I see a property come on the market that looks amazing and I will submit an offer and I will make it, I won't add additional contingencies. I'll simply leave the typical, you know, 17 day or 14 day inspection period. And if I go and I do my inspection and I don't like it, well then I back out and it's no cost to me. I don't have to, I don't have to give up any of my deposit money or anything like that. On one occasion within the last year, I regret that I didn't do it. Uh, Now, this would have been slightly different. This would have been a different deal. This was for a lot. Um, As you folks know, one of my initial plans was not to sell my home and buy a new built home. My plan was to keep this home, buy a lot, build a home on it that would be custom, just made specifically for me to live in and then rent at some point. So it was hopefully going to be a lot that was big enough where I could put two two residences on it. I could, with the rules in the county here, I could put uh, a primary residence. And then as long as the secondary building didn't have more than, I think, 2,000 square feet, I think is the maximum. Or maybe it's 1,800 square feet. I don't recall what the number is. But that was the plan. So I'd be able to have two income-generating properties on the same lot. Um, and what stopped me was I couldn't find a lot, right? We I, I, I went, this was, this was probably a year ago when... Uh, and I'm still searching to be honest, where I was going to every single lot that came on and I would find it's either too, it's either too much in the worst of the flood zone or it didn't have at least electricity coming to the property line, which is mandatory for me. Um, or it was vertical lot. It just, it had problems. It didn't meet my criteria. Lot came up about nine months ago. It was perfect. It was a two acre lot. It was, it was still in the flood zone, but not in the deepest of the flood zone. It was in one of the the lesser uh, flood zones uh, that that is totally tolerable. It was literally in the same basic flood zone that the entire city of Morgan Hill is in. Um, 
prop it not only did it have electricity to the lot line it had sewer to the lot line which is also fantastic because then you are able to keep more of the lot usable for other things right because you can't build on top of your leech lines when you have a septic system so that was fantastic and it came on the market and i thought you know i'm going to go ahead and drive over there over the weekend and take a look at it and it was gone <laughs> it literally was on the market for two days and it disappeared and it was at an amazing price so I regret not having done it then because on paper it looked fantastic, but lesson learned, I guess the next time I find something that looks absolutely like a hundred percent fit, then submit the offer and worry about doing that uh, inspection after you've gotten your offer accepted. So just keep that in mind. You know, I think that's one thing that stands in the way a lot of first time investors, they feel like uh, once they have written that offer, they're committed I guess to a certain extent, that's true. I mean, you've extended an offer and if that offer is accepted, you are in a deal. But the reality is, is that there are specific things, criteria that are built into that offer that will give you the opportunity to to back out if your expectations are not met. So don't think of it as something you should not be willing to do when you have a genuine interest in the property. Just be ready to back out if needed. Don't don't fear backing out any more than you feared back backing in, right, by submitting your offer. Um, there's nothing wrong with being aggressive. You don't want to be the person who you, – you want to reach a certain level of certainty about what you want to do because in a marketplace, you don't want to get known as the person who writes all these offers and then never follows through on them, uh, particularly if you plan on being someone who's going to be working in a local market uh, pretty regularly. Uh, but – you know, use that as a tool for you to get in there, get into the deal and analyze whether or not uh, that specific property is as good as you hope. Uh, so anyway, I, I hope that's helpful because I know an awful lot of folks, they, they really get stressed out during the creation of the offer. So don't let that stress you out. It shouldn't. All right. So we're going to jump into some pretty shocking news next because it represents a complete about face from stuff we've been talking about over the last month. Um, and it's, it's a little bit bizarre. Uh, we talked about this exact, this is data that is not, you know, research that was done by some organization that now contradicts a different organization. This is the same organization. It's one of the reports we cover on this show every time a new one comes out, which is monthly. And it's a little bit mind blowing given the other data we've talked about. So don't go away. We'll be right back to talk about that after a quick break. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, The Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back everyone. So I was a little surprised when this data came out. We're talking about the Fannie Mae uh, home purchase sentiment survey. And we talk about this one pretty much every month because it's a, it's a good one to go with. It usually has a pretty good uh, sample size in, in terms of, of trustworthy data. Uh, so it was a little bit shocking to see this one come out. Uh, this is the article I'm getting it from a CNBC. Now, I, as always, I will include a link to the CNBC article, but I'll also include a link directly to the National Housing Survey page itself. And from there, you can access the data and and uh, get into the nitty gritty yourself if you would like. Um, but what's interesting is now try to keep in mind, for those of you who are regular listeners, you know the data we've been talking about over the last few weeks in general, not just this Fannie Mae data, but but confidence data and what people are doing data, employment data is looking relatively good. Uh, we've actually seen quite a bit of good news. And I'll tell you, it's been an interesting change of pace uh, to be able to report news that actually sounds pretty good. 
So here we are with the official numbers for March on the home purchase sentiment survey from Fannie Mae, where we see that after hitting an all-time high in February, uh, the share of Americans who reported that now is a good time to buy fell 10 percentage points. Consumers also reported dramatically less confidence in the stability of their jobs, which is odd because literally less than a week ago, another outlet, I don't recall which one, but we talked about it here on this show, talked about people having all this great confidence in work moving forward. Um, we've seen improvements in, in this past data relating to all of these metrics. Uh, those who reported that their household income is significantly higher than it was 12 months ago fell eight percentage points. Uh, Compared with February, this as home price gains accelerate in most major markets with some hitting new highs. Uh, Let's see. Now, one thing that it does mention that I think is a good point to make is, quote, the housing market could still see a tailwind from more new listings this spring. But whatever the jump in supply, it is highly unlikely to meet current demand. Home builders are still operating below historical norms, partly because they can't find enough labor to put up the homes. The employment report released Friday showed only a very slight increase in construction jobs, not enough to make much of a difference. Uh, Quote, although growth in wages and labor force participation would have been good news for the future of the housing market, the critical metric right now is residential construction jobs, said Neela Richardson, chief economist at Redfin. This is the number to worry about from the home buyer's perspective. So, and we talked about that uh, when those numbers originally came out a week or two ago. Uh, the 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 construction situation looks good. We all the various metrics that we use to measure whether or not home buyers confidence equals more homes tended to increase. We saw permits increase. We saw lumber prices uh, moving in a direction that indicate higher demand. So we we see actions taking place that seem to indicate that we're going to get more home, more homes. But as I pointed out, I tend to agree with these folks. I don't think it's likely that that equals price drops in homes. I honestly don't think that they're going to build enough homes to satisfy the demand. Now, what is going to be an interesting thing to note is what happens with this new construction that I think we're going to see. Now, the the labor problem will go away because it always does. Uh, As demands for jobs and construction increase, the folks who don't have a job doing something else are going to look over to that and say, well, okay, there's there's good paying jobs over here in construction, so I'm going to do them. And we've already looked at other data that shows that uh, what builders are paying laborers in construction has gone up simply because they're trying to entice more people in. That's the way a free market works. As soon as someone sees they're paying more money over here, they're going to be gravitating towards that. So that problem will work itself out. It's just a question of how much time that takes. And once that starts rolling, the question in my mind is, how long does it last? My feeling on that is it lasts as long as it makes money, and at the front end, it's absolutely going to make money. Uh, We've discussed on this show why has there been so much hesitancy on the part of buyers to jump in and just build to meet the demand, and I guess the answer really is, is provided by what we saw with the downturn, where we had amazing levels of builders building homes only to right when things went at the moment, things went wrong, taking a loss on a lot of homes, having to really drop those prices because the market had really crumbled beneath their feet. So I think a lot of those folks are hesitant to jump in, but I think as soon as you see one or two builders, three builders jumping in there and getting in and starting to make money, others are going to realize that we're missing an opportunity here to take advantage of this level of demand. And so At what point does that balance out? At what point do we start to see builders building to the point where the the balance between supply and demand is a little bit more even, but not building beyond that point so that suddenly prices drop? Because that's what builders want to avoid, right? They don't want to get to the point where they they overbuild and then suddenly their overbuilding negatively affects what they can afford to charge for a home. Um, We talked about six months ago, about the expectation on the part of a lot of experts that we would we would see demand levels, or excuse me, inventory levels meet demand levels, probably not until 2020. Maybe this is the beginning of that cycle. Maybe instead of it being a big surge of construction that starts happening in, in 2019 that builds to 2020, maybe this is going to be a several-year buildup to the point where we start to meet that balancing act. Time will tell. 
We'll see where it goes. But honestly, I think that this building trend will continue to get encouraged by the way the market works. Um, but there's also on that topic, another interesting article. Now, one thing I've mentioned over, over the last few weeks has been how much I wish more time was being spent pointing out what the real problem is relating to inventory. Well, we are starting to see more of that happen. It's been few and far between, but over the last couple of weeks, different articles that we've brought up here on this show sort of either mentioned it in general terms without giving any specifics. And then actually yesterday and the day before, we saw a couple of articles that are actually starting to acknowledge this is a problem and this is the solution. So uh, an article came out from Housing Wire, uh, the headline property radar. No, California is not in a housing bubble. I'm not 100% sure I'm totally on board with that conclusion, but um, they're talking about home sales having fallen to the lowest level since 2008, which is absolutely an inventory problem. But what's great is my assumption going in and starting reading this article was, okay, they're going to they're gonna start pumping this hole. We need to create more buyers line, which is the opposite of what we need. But no, that's not where they took it. If you skip down um, to the, to the end of the article, sadly, it's at the end. Uh, people tend to only read the first couple of paragraphs, but at the end, the, 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 uh, writer states quote, local state and federal housing regulations have made it, excuse me. That's not the writer. This is, this was said by Madeline Schnapp, director of economic research for property radar. And she was quoted as saying, quote, Local, state, and federal housing regulations have made it all but impossible for builders to meet housing demand in California's growing economy. Conceptually, the solutions to California's affordability crisis are simple, but politically, we should expect the current situation to continue for the foreseeable future. So what we're the point here is, is that any success we're going to see, any growth, any additional construction is going to have to be in spite of a lot of this in terms of regulations, in terms of the things that are called out here in this article. Uh, but as long as money is to be made, it'll happen. But the problem is it'll continue to push prices up, or at least it'll continue to keep the prices new homes are offered at on the higher end, simply because there's all these other things built into it. Now, the other topic of this particular article I wanted to hit on, um, is another assertion made by this same woman from, uh, property radar saying that, let's see, all the surging home prices do not add up to a housing bubble. Quote, it's a market dislocation caused largely by government policy. A housing bubble requires both an unwarranted surge in prices followed by a massive sell-off. She goes on to say a massive sell-off is unlikely because a regulatory change in 2009 means that even if consumers default on their loans, Banks will now sit on inventory rather than foreclose and sell like they did in 2008. I'm not sure that that particular statement results in what she thinks it does, or at least what she's asserting it does. Um, if they, if folks default on their loans, I mean, remember we, the, the, the painting we've been trying to put together is one of debt, whether you want to call it, have it be mortgage debt or student loan debt, or car debt. We've talked about all these various chunks of debt. In fact, the student let debt now rivals the level of debt that we had at the peak of the housing crisis. Um, so it's a, more of a debt management problem, and then what happens after that. Now, regardless of what happens in terms of whether or not people get foreclosed on, um, the the book value of what these things are is still hit. Um and one thing she says that is a little odd to me, because maybe this was what was happening nationally, because it's not what was happening here. Uh, according to her quote, banks will sit on inventory rather than foreclose and sell like they did in 2008. See, in my area, they didn't do that. Uh, they may have foreclosed, but they didn't sell. Uh, and I don't know of any new regulatory changes in 2009 that equal you don't get foreclosed on. There are some carve outs for some very specific types of, of mortgage holders uh, or, or folks paying mortgages, certain folks living in those homes to give them extra time. But the idea of denying a bank the ability to foreclose is ridiculous. So I'm not real sure what point she's trying to make. I actually tried to Google what she's talking about, and I didn't see anything relating to that that would forestall a foreclosure process. 
Um, and remember what happened last time. Uh, remember, we had folks that got foreclosed on and stayed in that home for years. Years. We did shows about it. So even if, even if let's say that we acknowledge that what she is saying is true. Well, it's, it's, what, it's what happened anyway. We had tons of people who got foreclosed on and never moved out of their homes and stayed in there for years. Um, most of the banks in my area sat on the inventory. Remember the ghost inventory that we talked about? The shadow inventory, I think is what it was called. Try Googling shadow inventory or go to my website and, and Google it and, and search on shadow inventory. Or sh- since my show has changed locations over the last few years, so some of this shadow inventory stuff would be old, old, old. But if you Google rebel broker shadow, inv- shadow inventory, I'll bet you find something. Or forget the rebel broker part, just do a search on shadow inventory. You'll see articles going back to 2010, 2008, uh, all the way back that talk about huge leaps um, of, of, of the, the shadow supply of homes. I did shows where we talked about, uh, about appraisers that I knew that found themselves appraising the same home every six months because banks were holding onto it and just trying to assess what the value was every other quarter. I was looking at five homes in a large community right next door to my own that were foreclosed homes that were not on the market and they were there for two, three years in some cases. So I, I'm not real sure what she's on about as, as far as this goes. So if we discount what she has just said, well, what she has just said doesn't speak to the bubble problem. So my argument would be there's absolutely a reasonable position you can take where you would conclude that a bubble might just be on the horizon here. Uh, and all it really takes is some sort of a bad debt thing to happen. It doesn't even have to be a bad house thing. It could be a bad general economy thing. It could be a bad student loan thing. It could be a bad car loan thing. Uh, it could be a bad employment related thing. There's a lot of different a- angles from which this could be a problem. So there you go. Um, Now, of course, as I mentioned, I'm going to include links to all of these articles in the show notes for today's show. So make sure to check those out if if you'd like to uh, to uh, go a little deeper. As always, I truly appreciate you have gotten more value out of the show today than the time you spent listening. That's always my goal to give you more than you than you put in. Hope I achieved it. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I'm going to the happiest place on earth on Sunday with my sons. Maybe my last chance. My oldest is moving out this year, so it's kind of that. It's kind of that last hurrah for for me to do the dad thing with all my boys. So anyway, uh, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again for being a part of the show. Good luck to all of you on the $50 Amazon gift card drawing today. today. Get in there. Get your name in so you can potentially win that 50 bucks. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll talk to you all next time.